Welcome to the last breakout session of this uh, fossil fuel conference. Thank you for being here. Let me kindly introduce our panel of uh, this afternoon. It's about politics and fossil fuel supply, the politics of fossil fuel supply. We had many sessions about economics and now we learn something that uh, politics indeed is also very important. Uh, we'll hear about um, the combination of modeling and geopolitics. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this talk. Um, we have some uh, insights on um, how um, uh, information, misinformation is sometimes playing into this combination of politics and fossil fuels. Um, we hear about how, uh, for instance, trade unions and other political players have a role to play in fossil fuels and energy transitions. And then we move to, so to speak, case studies where our eminent experts here will illustrate uh, some examples of voting behavior, for instance, in Norway or um, opposition to fossil fuels um, uh, um, from the UK, uh, for instance. Um, we have a panel of five distinguished scholars and experts. Uh, um, and without further ado, I would like to invite uh, our first panelist, uh, to the podium here. It's Dr. James Price. He's a senior research associate at UCL with a passion for energy modeling and geopolitics and a PhD in physics from Bristol University. James, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, bridging the credibility gap between energy scenarios and energy geopolitics. And this is work that I've been doing with Mathieu Blondil from uh, Warwick University. He's the geopolitical expert. I am the energy scenarios modeler. So if I say anything uh, completely terrible, please forgive me. Uh, so a bit of an introduction um, first. Uh, as you'll all be aware that the, the, the future of the global energy system is highly uncertain. And one way we can deal with that is by developing scenarios of the transition, which are designed to explore potential futures um, using a, a consistent set of internal assumptions um, about key driving forces. And then uh, people like me can take that, uh, those qualitative scenarios and explore them and map them out uh, using energy system modeling, um, which is a quantitative approach that typically produces uh, smooth, least cost uh, uh, pictures of the evolution uh, of a given scenario. And you can see that represented here by that chart. So we have a, a smooth uh, rise in the deployment of renewables and a smooth decline in fossil fuels. And then these scenarios, both the, the narratives and the quantitative pictures that they paint, uh, are used by a range of stakeholders, fossil fuel companies, policymakers, etc., to understand how the future could evolve and also to make planning uh, decisions going forward. But in recent years, there's been growing critique about the global scenarios that are out there and the models as being overly technocratic and um, driven by heroic cost minimizing decisions that ignore the complexities of human behavior, of society, and of ecological systems as well. And coal is a great example of this. So if you look at the uh, special report from uh, the IPCC on 1.5 degrees there, scenarios would see uh, a 75% average reduction in worldwide coal consumption between 2020 and 2030. So that's a, a pretty massive drop over 10 years. And yet from uh, COP26, the Glasgow Pact was the first UNFCCC agreement to mention coal. And here we had to settle for a phase down rather than a phase out. So there's quite a, a, a gap there between the, the proposed futures coming from some of those models and the reality that we might expect uh, to see. And this is where energy geopolitics can enter in. It's uh, a study of the, the real world of the energy system today and how it might unfold. And it can be key to understanding some of these gaps between the energy scenarios uh, and the realities that they're trying to portray. And energy geopolitics contends that real world energy system transitions are, are complex and messy, i.e. not smooth, uh, with winners and losers, and if not managed, could lead to economic, um, political and social unrest. And so therefore, it's a key aspect of the transition. And we can see that uh, just by these two articles that I pulled out here, which are recent geopolitical events, so COVID and the war in Ukraine, They've, they've led to a rise in two potential narratives going forward. I mean, there are many more, of course, but these are getting traction at the moment. So our new prime minister in the UK, Liz Truss, uh, wants to extract more uh, oil and gas uh, from the North Sea. 
whereas other commentators suggest that it's better to go for energy insulation and low carbon uh, tech as a way of responding to the crisis that we see at the moment. And both of these are framed under the context of energy security, but they're quite radically different responses. So what we wanted to do here is conduct a review with the objective of, of trying to help stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean people like me that, uh, that work with these scenarios, that develop them, that model them, but also people that engage with the scenarios as well, to get to grips with what's the current relationship between global energy scenarios and modeling and the real world of energy geopolitics. And this is in terms of design and implementation and of the analysis of the outputs as well. So what we did is we got together a, a set of publicly available scenarios, which are the state of the art from BP, Shell, Equinor, the IEA and the IPCC. And then we developed a quantitative review framework based on Matthew's paper from last year, which breaks the transition down into a, a high carbon transition and a low carbon transition. And you can see some of the topics that this framework covers. There are subtopics in that, but uh, you can see on the left-hand side the, the high carbon topics and on the right-hand side uh, the low carbon topics. So, that, so that's how we approach this. We, we, we took these scenario documents and we used this framework to break them down. And so now I'm just going to run through two quick sets of, of, of findings. Firstly, from the BP Energy Outlook from, from this year. And the first headline uh, thing to note here is that the report doesn't actually mention geopolitics at all or any related term. Um, they do, however, include a so-called delayed and disorderly uh, scenario, which has a decade delay in mitigation, uh, but no clear rationale from a geopolitical perspective what might actually cause that. And so what we found is that essentially there's a focus on the, the high carbon supply side of the transition. And perhaps that's not too surprising given the fact this is uh, BP, it's a fossil fuel company, they want to focus on their commercial interests. But it's, it's quite interesting about the lens that they're viewing these scenarios through. Um, just breaking this down into the high carbon side, you can see that there's a, a, a few points there. So, so BP reflects on how some exporters and producers um, may lose rents. Uh, there'll be a, ba a battle for market share between OPEC and non-OPEC uh, states and, and with OPEC dominating by 2050 because it has uh, cheaper resources and lower carbon intensity resources as well. And they expect the US to become um, much less of a, a player in global LNG trade, simply by the physical distance between the US and the declining markets in Asia. So there's some, some coverage there from a high carbon perspective. From a low carbon perspective, it's pretty much absent. There's passing mentions of wind and solar capacity depending on uh, such things as key materials, planning, uh, so, uh, social acceptance, et cetera. But really, it's not clear how this actually factors in to the modeling and the scenario design. And then we have uh, Shell. And Shell, of the three oil and gas companies that we look at, they take a, a, a more, uh, more engagement with geopolitics. Um, they have an explicitly geopolitical scenario, which is called Islands. Um, that, and that sees a new geopolitical order developing uh, which is a focus on uh, national security and trade barriers. And that takes shape, and as a result, uh, the world fails to achieve the Paris Agreement. Interestingly, we found that there's a lot less engagement uh, on a, from a geopolitical perspective in Sky 1.5, which is their 1.5 degree scenario. And this, we infer, seems to say that geopolitics is, is being seen, is being framed as a negative for the transition, um, it's an impediment to successful energy transition under climate objectives. From a high carbon uh, perspective, um, Shell clearly think that oil and natural gas are going to continue to shape geopolitics uh, for decades to come, which again gives a, a lens into how they think about um, these types of scenarios. Interestingly, there's no mention of stranded assets in Sky 1.5, but it's, uh, it, it's covered in waves, which, or, which also fails to achieve uh, Paris as well. And there's some mention of capital markets uh, and how they become risk averse to uh, fossil fuels going forward. So there's, again, uh, some high carbon focus there, but the low carbon transition, it's fairly absent. Um, thank you. Uh, so 
from a Sky 1.5 perspective, that's quite surprising because Shell rely on nature-based solutions, uh, basically planting forests, uh, which covers an area of around 700 mega hectares, which is a, a, a huge land area, roughly equivalent to Brazil, I think. Um, and so to, to not consider the wider impacts of that um, seems, seems quite uh, strident, shall we say. Um, and then we've got uh, China and the US being expected to work together to address uh, um, pressing global issues, which perhaps doesn't engage with uh, geopolitical realities at the moment. So this is my final slide, just some key takeaways from this. So we, we, we've seen that geopolitics is, is generally under-discussed uh, under across these scenarios, and where it is discussed, it's a focus on the um, supply side of fossil fuels, uh, and it's unclear if and how that actually shapes the scenarios that we're seeing. The second point I'd like to make is that geopolitics is, is mainly framed as a reason why a scenario doesn't achieve uh, the Paris Agreement. So it's seen as a negative, an impediment, as I've said. And it's ignoring some of the potential benefits, which essentially you could imagine if we reorder away from the power concentrations around fossil fuels to a more uh, um, diffuse concentrations around renewable energy, that can be quite useful from a geopolitical perspective. Um, and related to this, what we found is that 1.5 degree scenarios are, are worlds of cooperation and coordination. And, and perhaps uh, that's quite an idealistic view of the world. And if that's the only way that we can envisage uh, achieving a 1.5 degree world, then that's slightly worrying, I would argue. And then finally, what we've seen is there's a, a lack of engagement uh, with low carbon uh, transition issues. Um, and the topics that do get some attention are critical materials and negative emissions, which is perhaps, again, not too surprising, given that there are three fossil fuel companies in our review. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, also for keeping almost on time. Um, but we employ tolerance here. And next, uh, I would like to invite Ms. Laura Peterson, a corporate analyst and advocate for the Union of Concerned Scientists with a background in investigative journalism and a professional experience in the U.S. Senate where she sat on the Oversight Committee and she will talk about climate risk disclosure and disinformation in the U.S. Laura, the floor is yours. All right, so as you said, I'm with the Union of Concerned Scientists and I'm with the Climate Accountability Campaign, which focuses on um, holding fossil fuel companies um, accountable for their contributions to climate change. Now, this has changed a little bit since I initially you know, wrote my proposal six months ago. Um, it was somewhat overtaken by events, which is how it is in public policy. So um, we are going to be looking, but we are, I do still want to start with um, climate risk disclosure, which a lot of you may be familiar with. This is basically the concept of um, publicly listed companies having to disclose the risk that climate change poses to their bottom line, uh, to disclose to investors, I should say. And the chief financial regulator in the US is the Securities and Exchange Commission. And just to do a very quick overview, um, the, the US has been making halting steps toward implementing a climate risk disclosure rule over the last decade. The SEC put out a guidance on climate change, um, risk disclosure, sorry, in uh, 2010. Uh, there was a shareholder vote in 2017 that forced ExxonMobil to pr start producing a, a, something like a climate risk disclosure report. Um, there, was a, there was a bill introduced by Democrats in Congress in 2021, which did pass the House, but it wasn't until the Biden administration came in uh, in May 2021 that things really started rolling. He put out an executive order um, that basically got a lot of federal agencies looking at climate risk disclosure, and then the SEC put out a draft rule in March of this year. So a draft, a, a draft rule means that you put it out, there's 60 to 90 days for the public to comment. Then they you know, take these comments, think about it, um, and uh, come out with a final rule. So at this point, the, the cutoff for comments was uh, July, late June, early July. They haven't come out with a final rule yet. But uh, this is a very long, le very lengthy, very substantive rule. Um, it would do many things, but most importantly, it would affirm materiality of climate risk to investors. Materiality is this um, 
legal term that basically means it would help investors um, make decisions, would mandate emissions disclosures, including scope three. Oh, look, I can use this. I don't have to point. Um, and it would bring the U.S. in line with existing international frameworks. So they got a lot of comments. They got about 15,000 comments 10,000 of those were um, form letter comments. So you guys know what form letters are. And so the SEC counts that as only one comment, but 90% of those were in support of the rule. Um, an analysis by uh, the accounting firm KPMG found that of the 4,000 individual comments, they were was broadly supportive. Um, the opposition from fossil fuel industry and trade associations was, on, was basically along the lines of, uh, this does not. This is outside the SEC's mandate. The mandate it was given in 1934 um, by Congress, and um, that it's too difficult to basically to measure Scope Three, and that companies shouldn't be held accountable for that. Um, that's a very very basic way of <laughs> summarizing their comments. We can talk more about that later. But investors have shown that they are very very supportive. Um, through you know letters that they've written and their comments. All right, so on to the opposition. So the first thing that happens, um, well, what, uh, many things start happening. Um, this is attorney, West Virginia Attorney General Patrick Morrissey. Um, he is involved in something called RAGA, Republican Attorney General's Association. He leads 23 other Republican attorneys general in filing a comment opposing the rule, um, saying basically the same complaints um, as the comments that the trade associations and uh, fossil fuel industry had written, but in a more full-throated way, basically saying that this is, you know, administrative state overreach, government overreach, et cetera, that's just completely illegal to try to regulate something that is unregulatable and that Congress has not empowered the SEC to regulate. Um, and then I don't know how many of you have been um, outside the US have been tracking this. We can talk more about this later, but the Supreme Court um, made a decision that basically said that EPA couldn't regulate, couldn't enforce the Clean Air Act, which prompted another letter along the same lines. Um, and things start to get very strange. and. Around about six months ago, this American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC, which some of you may have heard of, this is a nonprofit organization funded by fairly far right wing funders such as the Koch brothers, um, and they draft model legislation, which they then distribute through at the state and local level. Um, so they first come out with something called the Energy Discrimination Elimination Act, which basically, it's, and it's pretty direct. It says any um, business, like any company, such as like an asset manager, a bank, et cetera, that discriminates against fossil fuels should not be given state money, basically. Um, and then in May, the SEC comes out with a, another couple of rules that's trying, that are trying to basically rein in, which I'm sure a lot of you who work on ESG knows, is sort of a wild west of ESG funds. You know, there's a lot, not a lot of regulation. Not, you know, people can kind of call anything ESG. So they have some, frankly, pretty loose re regulations there that also prompts a strong pushback. Um, and then there's uh, another bill approves the State Government Employees Retirement Protection Act, which basically says that um, pension funds should not be going, government contracts should not be going um, into funds like BlackRock, et cetera, that are, that are woke, that support these, you know, liberal, um, you know, progressive ideas such as divesting from fossil fuels. And this is our former president, Mike Pence, talking about woke, the woke um, wolf of Wall Street. Um, all right, so here's a, this is our, you know, the definition of disinformation from our website, um, just, just to distinguish between opposition and disinformation. So uh, they, can, they can, you know, obviously sort of 
um, affect one another. But we're seeing some fairly blatant disinformation um, in some of the discussion of the rule and ESG. I also want to make the point that the this ESG regulation and the um, okay, my timer is still going. Um, this the ESG rule and the climate risk disclosure rule are really being lumped together by opponents. So so it's all getting thrown together in in far right communications vehicles as woke capitalism. So even though they're very different issues, they are um, sort of being put in the same basket of, of, of progressive social ideas that are now being um, becoming entrenched in government. Um, so now here's just a couple of, of um, examples of disinformation that we saw about the rule. The American Farm Bureau, a very conservative organization, falsely claims the rule would force farmers and ranchers to disclose personal information and business data. And this has been re repeated by not even particularly conservative lawmakers, actually, in their, you know, on the floor and that kind of thing. But, but lo lawmakers from rural areas start repeating this a lot. Um, and um, social scores, this is an idea of, this, this also comes up a lot in far-right messaging about how China has a, a federal social credit score, which can be used to punish um, citizens and companies that um, are not living up to, thank you, um, to their duties. And so who's pushing this dis disinformation? These are all very, um, these might be very familiar actors to some of you. These are all groups that have deep ties to far-right funders. A lot of them have had ties to the, um, the fossil fuel industry in the past, although after a lot of pressure, um, a lot of fossil fuel companies have withdrawn their support. And um, the Heartland Institute in particular has been very active in pushing some of this um, disinformation, which I can give you an example of later. So the takeaways are uh, basically, you know, the far right is including risk disclosure and ESG investing in this culture war idea, idea of, um, and I think that that is really, um, encapsulated well. I know you can't read this down here, but this is this guy's Jerry Taylor. He used to work for the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank in Washington. And he was sort of their frontline guy in the 90s that was taking taking on climate change, you know, doing a lot of climate denial work. And he's sort of, he's a little bit of an apologist now. And this is from a, um, a documentary that he was in recently, that the Black Gold documentaries, and some of you may have seen where he says, we realized we didn't need to change minds. We didn't need to reach out and win people over who are ambivalent. What you need to do is appeal to the Republican right and mobilize them for war. And it's part of a longer quote where he talks about putting these issues in the same basket as guns and abortion and other cultural issues that kind of allows them to, to weaponize, um, you know, to, to, to weaponize this sort of emotional reaction um, that a lot of Republican voters have to these issues. It's a dangerous strategy because it negates science and facts and it removes the need for understanding. Like he's saying, you don't actually have to educate anybody. You just have to sort of, you know, create this emotional reaction. And I try to leave on a positive note because I hate it when people just give you a litany of woe and um, with no idea about how to make it better. I, I will say that there has been some, I think, very effective um, op-eds just in the last few weeks, a recent examples, one from Michael Bloomberg in the Wall Street Journal who said something along the lines of these guys need to be, um, need a crash course in capitalism. So reminding, having fiscally conservative voices reminding people that this is actually a very anti-free market idea and that's kind of what conservatism started as. Like, that might help. It might not. But um, <laughs> one can hope. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, always nice to hear how creative American lawmakers are with giving names to bills. The Energy Discrimination Elimination Act. Um, <laughs> on this note, I'd like to invite our third speaker, Christian Downey, an associate professor at Australian National University, who advised several Australian governments and agencies, and also is also a prolific writer of academic papers on energy issues. Christian, 
The floor is yours, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming along to this final session. Uh, it was nice to end on a positive note, but I'm just going to compound you now with more negativity about the United States. So, um, so in recent years, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, I guess, the role of business and how you overcome uh, the entrenched incumbent interest uh, that we've just been talking about. So it's in that context that I want to talk about a paper that I'm working on with a colleague, uh, Professor Bob Brawl at Brown. And we've been thinking a lot about trade associations. Um, so as, as we've just seen, uh, it's been a really good example. There's increasing empirical evidence about how business actors in the US have been thwarting efforts to implement climate policies. We know a lot about what's going on in the US now. We know a lot about uh, what's going on in Western Europe as well. But there hasn't been as much about the role of trade associations, which are bodies that represent firms and do a lot of the dirty work for them. The second kind of gap in the literature is that in political science, especially most studies of business activity, the unit of analysis is the firm and it's operationalized typically by looking at lobbying or political contributions. But we know that that's a kind of only part of the issue. Uh, that there's a whole range of other things they do. Um, so what we try and do in this paper is do a bit of an exploratory analysis of who are the trade associations, what's their funding, where are they spending it, basically to try and follow the money. And I'll say a bit more about it in a moment, but uh, basically we look at the years 2008 to 2018, so that decade period, trade associations that we look at spent $3.4 billion trying to shape the political environment around climate change. Okay, so um, a few things that I want to do. One is talk about who they are, how much money do they have. Uh, the second is to look at where they're spending that money. And then third, to try and explain why, because we see big variations in the types of things they're doing. And that's just some of the logos of the big ones. Uh, actually, the American Coal Council just changed its name to America's Power, uh, but you will be familiar with many of them. Before I do, let me say a little bit about our methods and data. So we've got a sample of 87 trade associations across nine sectors of the US economy. They were derived basically by just looking at some of the existing qualitative studies that are out there uh, and also looking at who appeared before Congress. And then what we did is we basically went through their tax data. So they've got, uh, the US is quite good on this. There's much better disclosure practices than in my own country, Australia. So you can look up their 990 forms and look at how much money they've got and where they're spending that money and they disclose a bit of it. Um, one of the nice things is that that allows you to disaggregate the data by type of political activity. Uh, and then the second thing we did is interviews with, uh, which we've been targeting um, vice, vice presidents of government affairs or government relations, because they're the ones that typically make the decisions about uh, strategies. And actually, I just spent the last week uh, in DC doing some more interviews for this paper. Uh, we've been talking to folks like the Farm Bureau, who interestingly spend a lot of time cooperating with API uh, as well. So yeah, it's really interesting to, to hear that. So that's a bit about how we've gone about it. Okay, so who are they? Well, this is us looking at their revenue. Um, Basically, every sector in the US economy has one big trade association and then a series of smaller ones that look after different parts of the industry. Um, so that if you look at that purple box, that's the gas and oil sector. So each box is a sector. So in the gas and oil sector, the main trade association is the American Petroleum Institute. And then some of the smaller ones there, uh, like the American Fuel and Petrochemicals, uh, that represents refiners. Western States Petroleum, that's just all the oil companies uh, working out in Oregon, California, they're represented. This is by total revenue. So that you can see there that uh, the purple box, that oil and gas has by far the largest revenue. That's, that box there is just $4.6 billion. Uh, peak trade associations, Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, they also have revenues in excess of $4 billion for the decade that we're looking at. And then you come down to this little box here. That's the renewable energy sector just down there. So you can see uh, some of the differences. In fact, if you think about the climate change politics and all the industries that typically oppose climate change, oil, gas, coal, rail, steel, uh, and you add them up, you're looking at 14.3 billion revenues for industries against climate change versus 580 million for. 
Um, and that's not including peak trade associations. And we know from qualitative studies that um, they typically come out opposed to climate action. We saw that a lot uh, during uh, Obama's attempts to implement uh, a series of legislation and regulation. Um, and that also wasn't including uh, agriculture there. And we've just seen how the Farm Bureau is involved in this too. Okay, so that's their revenues. What about where are they spending their money? So as I mentioned, over the, that 10 year period, um, across all sectors, 3.4 billion was spent. It's about 13% of their revenue is spent on politi political activities. By far the largest, as you can see in the middle, is oil and gas. They're the ones spending the most, uh, followed by the peak trade associations, as I mentioned, like the Chamber of Commerce and others. Um, Again, if we compare spending by industries typically opposed to climate change versus four, it's $2 billion being channeled with activities to essentially obstruct climate action versus 74 million uh, for. So 2 billion versus 74 million uh, gives you an idea of why we're sometimes losing the battle. And we also know from political science, right, that firms spend more on political activities than trade associations. Uh, so this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Interestingly, you can see what they're spending their money on. Uh, oil and gas is spending more on advertising and promotion, uh, and that's the largest. So actually, this graph makes it a little bit clearer. So you can see the vast majority of the money is being spent on essentially on PR. So total spending on advertising and promotion is 2.2 billion. Uh, lobbying, uh, you can see there as well, 729 million. Um, Interestingly, because this is that political contributions are only a really small amount uh, for trade associations. And this kind of highlights as well, it, it kind of, uh, I think it challenges some of the conventional assumptions in a lot of political science that lobbying and political contributions are the main political activities. Because actually when you follow the money, at least for trade associations, what you're seeing is that grants and advertising and promotions, two things that we often overlook in the literature, uh, are bigger than lobbying and political contributions by a factor of about three to one. Um, and I can say a little bit more about uh, a little bit more about why why this is the case, and also about the types of campaigns. So the types of campaigns that we've just heard about, that's where some of these these funding is going. Um, a lot of that PR money is going to firms that set up uh, PR campaigns, astroturf groups, etc. And that's what we're digging into with some of the interviews. So the final uh, thing that I wanted to understand a little bit about was, so why are they spending so much on PR and less on lobbying and so forth? And that's what we're still digging into. There was four kind of possible determinants from the literature or four hypotheses that we tested. You know, one is it because trade associations are a little bit different? Uh, is it to do with their role and functions? A second explanation we looked at is, well, to what extent is it by nature of issue? Do they, do they spend differently on different issues or is it the characteristics of industry or the effectiveness of different strategies? So we've done about 20, I think about 25 interviews so far. Um, and when you go through the, the interview data, the key kind of empirical relationship that stands out is that it's to do with the role and functions of trade associations. That's one of the main explanations for why we see so much spending on advertising and promotion. And that's because, um, as you can see in, in this quote, basically members, so that's the firms, that's your ExxonMobil, your, uh, your ConocoPhillips and whoever else is members of the API, for example, uh, they see trade associations playing a role as managing their reputation. So they do that in two ways. One, they run positive campaigns. For those of you yesterday that went along to uh, some of the, the panels that we're talking about, some of the PR campaigns, they run positive campaigns about you know, how these companies are gonna be the solution to climate change. But they also run negative campaigns attacking either other industries or NGOs or pieces of legislation. The reason they run some of the dirtier campaigns is because firms don't wanna be tarnished by coming out against climate change necessarily. And so they'd rather pay a third party like their trade association to do it for them. If it's a particularly kind of pernicious campaign, sometimes it'll be a, a, you know, a third or fourth party. So by being less directly involved in some of these political activities, it protects reputation, particularly for branded companies. The other thing that came out in the interviews 
is that a lot of the uh, so VPs for government affairs that I spoke to, they often thought that um, lobbying and uh, advertising and promotion were more effective. Now, trying to test that quantitatively is a little bit tricky, but often they saw political contributions, as you can see here, political contributions quite small, they saw as less effective, which I think is important because a lot of the literature tries to look at the impact of political contributions, say, on roll call votes in the US Congress. And in fact, uh, not a lot of money is going to that. So I've got the nice wrap up thing. So I'm going to wrap up um, just by saying that um, two quick takeaways. One, trade associations are a big part of the problem. Uh, you know, $3.4 billion uh, arguably spent trying to obstruct climate action. And two, whether you're thinking about um, the climate domain or other domains like social policy and so forth, I think we often overlook the role that trade associations play. And there's a huge, you know, there's a huge gap in the literature and it merits a lot more scholarly attention. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Christian. Always interesting to see numbers and figures to these kind of behind the scenes maneuvering. Uh, next uh, on presentation schedule is Guri Bang, Associate Professor at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences and former director of the Norwegian Research Centre Cicero and an international expert on international governance. Please, Guri, you have the floor. Well, actually, not the director, but the research director. This is a lower level, but, you know, anyway, thanks for that kind introduction, and I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, I'm talking today about this uh, um, paper that I'm in the process of writing together with a Fergus Green college colleague from uh, the University College of London uh, on uh, oil politics and comparing the causes and effects of anti uh, fossil fuel mobilizations in Norway and uh, the UK. So, um, the backdrop for this paper was that we had observed over sort of this similar tendency in, the, in both Norway and the UK, uh, starting after the Paris Agreement in 2015, but uh, also increasingly visible around the time of uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, with more politicization of oil and gas supply, um, especially the issuance of new licenses for oil and gas exploration in these two countries. And so uh, the issue was transformed from um, um, a state of uh, quiet politics or not so visible politics into a hotly contested political issue in this period. Um, and in Norway, especially, uh, we saw this increasing focus on the paradox of aiming to be a climate leader, uh, but at the same time, uh, a major oil and gas producer. So this paradox was very much in, uh, in focus at this time. So this is the backdrop for the study. Um, and in the literature, we see what you know, what is politicization and uh, the liter literature on agenda setting and issue attention uh, points to uh, three factors which we are um, sort of uh, looking into in this paper, where salience, uh, increased salience means that uh, um, the issue receives more attention from policymakers and uh, the public. Uh, and polarization, referring to these ideological and uh, policy positional distances between um, actors involved in policymaking. And also um, an expansion of the actors and audiences that are involved in the debate. So this is the sort of the, the background for the study. And uh, First, we did um, a sort of descriptive research to sort of, um, um, yeah, to map the type of pol politicization that has been happening in uh, Norway and the UK around uh, this time that we were looking at. So we were doing uh, uh, media analysis and timelines for both the Norway and the UK. I'm just referring to the Norway case here. As you can see, there was a big attention um, uh, top around two th uh, 2021. So uh, there was attention in the media, newspapers, etc. More op-eds on the topic of issuing new uh, oil and gas exploration licenses. Um, 
press releases, um, also a lot of policy processes that were referred to in the media, and um, uh, protests and direct action that were um, sort of spoken about in, and given media attention. We see um, uh, this top in attention in 2021. And also if you see by quarter uh, to the left there, uh, for every quarter of the year, you see a specific attention around uh, um, the fall of 2021, when there was a parliamentary election in Norway last year. So, um, yeah, so this is um, the Norway case. And also we did the same for the UK, as I said, uh, for a media analysis. So this was um, establishing the fact that there is politicization going on in these two countries uh, at that time. And so the next step is to identify the causes and the consequences of, these, of this politicization. And um, so we had two research questions that we are uh, looking into. First, what factors may explain the politicization of fossil fuel supply in each country? And second, uh, what were the consequences of this politicization? And uh, our research design and uh, methodology, we're doing single case studies. Um, of Norway and the UK, and this is the stage where we are at right now doing these uh, case studies. We have finished the timelines and the desktop research. Uh, we are preparing for quantitative text analysis using the, the findings that we had from the databases that we um, looked into on media and then media attention. And then uh, we are preparing also for doing uh, semi-structured interviews with around 15 experts in each country. And we, we have done some of these interviews, but we are preparing to do more of them. Um, and then we're, um, uh, they are covering um, NGOs, um, labor unions, business representatives, government officials, um, and political party representatives. Um, trying to sort of target the same type of uh, uh, interviewees in each of the countries. Um, and then we're going to do a cross-country comparative analysis as well. So now, <clears throat> what can explain um, or what are the causes of this observed politicization that we have seen? So we have focused on um, events uh, that were used in a way as agenda setting tools um, and uh, also on um, this broadening coalitions uh, that uh, had introduced uh, shifting ideas about supply side climate policy and just transition um, um, and specifically this uh, minority subset of this pro-climate uh, alliance or uh, coalition that um, have introduced fossil fuel supply ideas into the coalitions. So um, interest group mobilization in, and combination of this, uh, these events where they used uh, events to introduce new understandings of the problem, um, to include fossil f uh, fuel supply elements and also um, proposing new solutions, for instance, like including uh, stopping new oil and gas licensing um, um, and a managed uh, phase out of oil and gas, um, including policies for a just transition of an affected workers and regions, um, and also the tactics. So targeting particular oil and uh, gas projects and licensing rounds uh, through direct action and uh, um, media and litigation. So for the Norway case, uh, that uh, means, that would mean that we saw uh, several events that led up to this politicization uh, process with uh, uh, new oil and gas licensing process that were very controversial, specifically the Wisting field, which is very far north uh, up into the Arctic um, Ocean at the Barents Sea. And also this combined with the COVID tax relief package in 2020 that uh, sort of made uh, the, the visiting field development possible, that made it economically viable. Um, and 
a couple of reports that brought new knowledge into the process, the IAA Net Zero report, IPCC report last year, and also this combined with the parliamentary election campaigns that were going on uh, over the summer and the, the fall. And interest groups mobilized uh, through using the climate lawsuit that was ongoing around the same time. So they used that those campaigns um, uh, or that campaign um, in combination with uh, responses to the reports from IEA and IPCC and uh, mobilized to stop the visiting field. And this is still ongoing because the visiting field decision is going to made, be made uh, later this fall. Um, and uh, interest groups uh, mobilized in, um, in collaboration with some political parties, green parties that mobilized to stop new oil exploration in the election campaign. So four minor political parties in Norway sort of are behind the idea of not is issuing more new licenses, uh, but they were not able to form a firm coalition during the election campaign. So only the Green Party put down an ultimatum uh, on this topic. The other ones were sort of willing to negotiate. Um, Whereas majority parties, around uh, 60 to 70 percent of what, uh, um, their parliamentary um, uh, majority, uh, these four major parties, they mobilized in sort of opposition to this uh, green mobilization and to uh, continue new oil exploration. So. <clears throat> There are also some elements uh, on the UK case. I won't have time to go into all of that. And uh, also it's uh, Fergus that has done the research there. So you can ask him in the break. <laughs> but the Cambo field was definitely one um, element that drove the politicization in, uh, in the UK in combination with the upcoming Glasgow uh, COP and the role of the UK as the host country. So, um, Moving on to the consequences of politicization in Norway and UK. Uh, here we have um, sort of, we're going to lean on the interviews to do this uh, uh, assessment of consequences. And um, just going very quickly through uh, this, we're looking at how uh, coalitions, if and how coalitions have changed, whether political party positions have, have changed, whether we can see actual supply side policy outcomes, you can see some of the results here. I won't have time to discuss them, but I, one interesting element is this emerging rift in the labor movement in Norway, where we see a tension in the labor party between um, uh, the labor party itself and its youth organization, and also within the labor uh, organization, like the labor union association in Norway. So we will have to go come back to this under questions and answers. Um, but what I can say is uh, to the same, uh, the last point here, supply side policy outcomes. We say no for each, uh, both of the countries. Uh, and one of the main explanations here is the shifting context that we're seeing since uh, um, the fall of 2021, which is the Russia's war on Ukraine and the uh, ensuing energy crisis in, uh, in Europe very much changed circumstances uh, where oil and gas is now in demand, especially gas, and Norway has become uh, the reliable partner for Europe in delivering gas uh, um, in step with Russia's uh, close down of uh, North Stream 2 and uh, uh, gas supply. So this is all done uh, under this great project, uh, under JPI Climate, socially just and politically robust decarbonization with great partners in uh, several countries in Europe. And we have a, a nice cartoon also to show you. And um, thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Um, without further ado, I come to the last uh, presentation of our panelists. Um, that is uh, Mr. Florian Egli from ETH Zurich, an energy finance and energy uh, um, renewable finance expert and writer of an award-winning thesis. So please, the floor is yours. You have minus one minute. 
And also, I have, a, I have a very difficult spot. So it's the last talk. Then we're going to talk about Norway after you, Guri, <laughs> talked about Norway. I have no clue about Norway. Like, I'm not Norwegian. But there are Norwegian co-authors on this, so don't ask me too many particular questions about the case. Um, the, the question that we're trying to answer here is, I think, one that has popped up in many, many discussions that I've been having um, constantly. So it's basically politicians wanting to do something about this transition, asking themselves, if I do it, what's the price? So we're living in democracies and politicians want to be reelected. And a lot of them ask themselves, can I actually afford to take ambitious measures to you know, phase out fossil fuels, for example, or what are the price that I'm going to pay two, three years down the road in the next election. So that's kind of the motivating bit here. And that's 60s. That's OK. <laughs> um, so why phase out? I don't need to talk about this, but I just always like this graph. I think it's fantastic. You see the, how different energy carriers basically build up the concentration, um, uh, CO2 concentration that we have today in the atmosphere. Um, a bit more on why Norway, um, it's interesting. First, because it's a multi-party democracy. So you're going to have several parties. We did sort of like similar studies on the US, for example, where you have a two-party system. It's very clear like who's you know, in favor of renewables or against, at least on a federal level. Um, whereas in Norway, you're going to have a lot of different parties, and they can position themselves on a spectrum, which is interesting. Um, and the second um, thing that is interesting is it has a very built-out social welfare state. So if you see a negative response to a decline in fossil fuels, um, from voters in Norway, then that's kind of bad news, right? Because there is a lot of protection here and a lot of kind of safety, um, um, you know, nets that you wouldn't have elsewhere. So it's in that case, um, if we see something in Norway, that's reason for concern. I'm going to skip over that. Um, that's just to show you um, a bit like the political science literature where this is rooted in and, and, and how the traditional left-right spectrum of parties is being broken up and it's coming more on issue politics. So there are different like issues that really frame the, or the political divide or discussion in, in democracies. And the question is, um, here, the fossil free, free economy is the next of these divisions. And is that going to lead to a reinforcement of a left-right division that we've had traditionally? Or is it going to sort of lead to new cleavages and different party positionings on this that are not the traditional left-right? Um, so I think also that's for context on the left. So there is a lot of work on phasing in in the political space, not so much on phasing out. Um, the two questions that we're interested in here is, one, how do these party parties position themselves in Norway on the issue of um, oil production, you know, continue or not, um, um, continue extraction, continue production, et cetera? Um, and how do voters um, reward or punish these positions in times of distress? So we're going to use. Um, an event in 2014 where actually quite a lot of jobs in the oil industry in Norway um, were lost. And we're going to look at, um, you know, was there a reaction of the voters um, to these local job losses in local communities? Um, so we're covering five national elections. Um, <laughs> given what I've just heard, we should extend this to 2021, I think, because it was a very, I mean, we've had these discussions many times. It was an extremely relevant topic, I think, now, right now, like, or last, um, last year in the elections. Um, these are the eight parties that held at least one seat in parliament in 2017. Um, and what we're going to use as information is party manifesto. So each party basically um, for each election has a manifesto where they you know, specify the position they take on different subjects, including um, the fossil industry. And that's how that looks. So here you see kind of one party. Um, that's the example is here, the Green Party. There, this is done for each party. And here you see the five electoral periods um, you know, between, between the elections that we're covering. And then you have statements. So the, the green statements here are pro possible pro-phase-out statements that have appeared at least once in any of the manifestos over time. And if it's a filled-in um, cell here, that means in this um, period, the Green Party has mentioned um, that investments in renewable for reduced petroleum production is, a, is something that they, you know, um, are invested in, that they campaign with. Um, in. And basically, that's how we can then build kind of, you know, how parties position themselves towards the industry. And over time, um, there is a couple of neutral ones. And then there is, here is the ones on the fossil fuel industry. Um, here are some of the results on the first question on how parties position themselves. 
Um, so what you see here is basically from zero to one here for green, um, so for phasing out, and here for, um, for gray, so for maintaining um, an oil industry. And if it's a one, that means in every time period, this part he has mentioned every possible statement there is in favor of the fossil fuel industry. Um, so that's, uh, point eight is pretty strong, right? Um, so that, that's a very, a very strong position. What you see is a ve very clear ordering. So you see there are three parties that almost never say something against the oil industry and very prominently and consistently say something in favor of maintaining the industry. And there are three that are really completely the opposite. And two in the middle are kind of a bit unclear. Um, now, the first thing to say here, this is not aligned on the right left spectrum. So if you remember the previous slide, because of course you have all the eight parties now and the abbreviations in your mind. Um, so this is the Labour Party, traditional left um, party, right? Which kind of, you know, corresponds to what you've been saying that their cleavage is, you know, starting to appear within the Labour movement. But um, for the period until 2017, it was very clear pro um, oil, and here is the Liberal Party that had a very pro phase out um, position. So we don't see this traditional left right. It's kind of like starting to break up, right? And parties try to find their positions on these issues. On these issues, and the other thing is what you see in red here is um, the coalition that was um, that was in government um, um, most recently. And so it's not really that there is a huge alignment in the government coalition. And next, when I'll show you the results, how people actually voted you'll see that it's not that people just voted against the existing government, but they actually had quite, you know, fine-grained choices depending on, um, on what the party's positions on the fossil fuel industry was. What's also interesting is it's very constant over time, so um, that's a bit contradicting what you said before, Guri, like, I mean, until 2017, we see that these positions are super stable over time. Um, these are the error bars here that you see over time, so it's really like little variation, um, which is surprising. So parties don't really reposition themselves on the issue. Um, I think I'll, yeah, I'll go quick on that. So what we're using is basically we're using a shock, an oil power shock that leads to a lot of job losses. So perhaps just look at the graph to the right, which is interesting, um, and you see on the on the y-axis here. Um, you see the relative change in petroleum jobs from 2014 to 2017, which is after the oil price dropped and which is before the 2017 election, which we're going to look at. And so this is the zero, right? So you see a couple of municipalities that have a few more jobs. So that's in percent, so 50% is a lot, right? Um, but then you see a lot of municipalities, the vast majority that lost jobs, some 100%. So for some municipalities, basically, it's just that's it. There is no, no person working in the oil industry anymore three years afterwards. And here on the x-axis, you see the fraction of petroleum workers as a share of the local workforce. Because you can say, yes, you know, you lost all of your jobs, but, you know, I don't know, it was like 1% of the local workforce, so it might not be that dramatic. But if you're here, that's 15% of your local workforce. And if you lose 25%, then that's like 7% of your local workforce that lost a job. That's a lot. So basically, um, they're basically, so these are the ones where we'd expect to see a reaction, right? So the industry is important locally and there were substantial job losses. And you'll see from the color codes that it's mainly like these provinces in the, in the southwest of Norway. So it's very locally concentrated and that makes it possible to identify an effect. And I'll quickly, I'll not talk about that. I'll quickly talk about um, effect sizes. So here again, you see the ordering, right? These are the three petroleum parties and the two neutral parties and the three parties that were pro phase out. And um, for now, I mean, ignore this. this is, these are like thresholds, how important is the local workforce? So you'd expect like as you go up there, the effect to be larger. So if it's 3% of your local workforce, you would expect a higher effect as opposed to if it's 1% um, or even less. Um, and what you see is that, you know, there is a positive reward for the pro-petroleum parties. So affected communities tend to vote more in favor of the pro-petroleum parties if they lose jobs. Um, not for this party. This is the Progress Party that just heavily campaigns against immigration. So the voters of this party just don't care about the issue. They vote for this party for immigration reasons and not for, um, for, uh, for fossil fuel reasons. Um, and, you know, you see a very interesting picture here. So these are the Greens. 
no response to the Greens. A bit of negative here to the Liberal Party, um, and I forget what SV is. Um, socialist left, a bit of positive here, but that's roughly, you know, around the zero. So parties are not punished for taking a pro phase out position, even in um, local communities where jobs are lost, but parties that don't take a position are punished, right? So, and that's actually encouraging news because you say, okay, well, if you're straight and if you have a position, you might not even lose in the communities that are very affected. But if you're very like blurry, nobody knows what you actually want to do. Um, then um, you might pay for like a large, a large structural transition. Um, so here are some of the um, some of the kind of dis discussion or conclusion points. The first one I think it surprised me quite a lot is that these positions are super constant over time for the almost 20 years we looked at. Um, and pro petroleum parties can capitalize a little bit on the job losses, but only if it's really their topic. If they're very invested in another topic, voters don't really care. Um, and you know, the neutral ones lose, not the pro phase out parties. I think that's the most important takeaway here. And this is also important. Whatever this is, it doesn't swing the national election. So it's very locally concentrated and that poses many important questions on like, how do you govern the transition locally? But it's not changing national elections. Like this is not large enough to, you know, swing elections. And that's something we see for the US as well. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you much, very much for the very insightful presentations. We talked about geopolitics and energy, about like how people finance uh, uh, fossil fuel lobbyism, et cetera, et cetera, and about voting behavior. Um, now I would like to open the floor um, to the audience. If you have questions, please state your affiliation, your name, and to, to who you direct the question. Uh, first come, first serve this gentleman in the first row, please. Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm, my name is Daniel. I'm from Concordia University, Montreal. I have a question for Florian. I was wondering, so the results you showed us, we didn't actually see the, do we see the, um, the absolute change in total votes due to economic downturns and job losses in oil sectors? And, and you show us that the neutral parties are hit harder, but, and the pro phase out ones weren't hit hard, but what was the, that doesn't actually show us the relative change, meaning like, uh, what was the voter share originally in the regions with high, um, with high amounts of oil jobs, were they already not voting? For, you know, to be clear, were they already not voting for pro phase out parties? So it's like they didn't lose votes, but they didn't have votes to begin with. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, please, Florian. Will. Um, yeah, I mean, so important question. Like there, like there are other slides to show that. Um, so of course, if you if you look even nationally, then. Um, the pro phase up parties don't have um, don't have a lot of like don't have very high vote shares, right? Um, but they're not zero, so there is something to lose. And what I showed you is percentage points, um, so it's not percent. So it's like if you know the Green Party is at five and they lose one percent, then it's at four afterwards. So there it's it's low. And if you I mean if you look at it, like some of these parties that are like at twenty percent and other are like five percent, right? So. Um, you know, there is more or less to lose, but the effects are in percentage points. So in that sense, they're comparable in terms of how many votes they represent. Okay. Other questions? Yes, the lady with the mask here. Sorry, I have to choose randomly. <laughs> black, black shirt, yeah, here. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Natalie from ISD. My question is primarily for Laura, but also anyone else on the panel with an opinion. Um, one of the things you noted was that um, like these, these woke, these kind of campaigns are, are very actually anti-free market, even though that was kind of the origin of these things. And I see, I think we're seeing this in a range of countries whereby we have this kind of extreme right wing, you know, like neo-fascist or like kind of authoritarian sort of tendency. Um, and I think this has a bearing on these same kind of supply side questions kind of increasingly. Um, do you uh, uh, what what do you think the prospects for or or you know what are the strategies for um fighting these these more sort of anti free market uh what you're talking about basically um thanks hope that's clear enough Laura please base i think that um <clears throat> one thing i i didn't note in there um i mean people like Michael Bloomberg, who I noted, um, Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, has come out and said, I am absolutely not, you know, divesting from fossil fuels, which he's not. Um, 
So I suppose if you are, so some of these voices, depending, could be considered um, conservative um, or sort of pro-capitalist. That might swing some people. But I think what's really going to swing people, there was actually a study uh, that came out a couple months ago, and it was by University of Pennsylvania and someone from the Federal Reserve that estimated that um, the adoption of that ALEC law in Texas, Texas was the first state to adopt that law, and I believe it, it's been, I think it was voted on in something like 15 states and passed in four, it might be up to six now, but, um, but Texas was the first, and they estimated that it was gonna result in something like $500 million. I think it was between four and $500 million in losses in interest. So this is like the, the state, um, and I can give you the you know, citation for this, but basically it's gonna hit people at some point in their, um, in their pocketbook. And if you're a pensioner, I mean, if it's something that really is going to impact um, your, it, impact the performance of a pension, then those, um, those investors will be able to bring complaints against the state, you know, for a breach of fiduciary fiduciary duty. So that's going to, that's just something that's going to play out in the future. I mean, a lot of people are, are looking at, um, yeah, legal and regulatory ways to try to prevent these political stunts, essentially, from really hurting people. But I think that bringing, but I think bringing it back to people, to the actual citizens, like this could actually affect you financially is going to be very important. Thank you very much. Um, Please, you have already the microphone. Yeah, um, I'm, this is uh, Bronwyn with uh, Oil Change International and a uh, question for uh, uh, Gary primarily, but um, I guess first, if you'd considered uh, changing the like no's in your outcomes for mobilizations to like not yet potentially, because I guess my like very basic understanding of kind of some social movement theory of like often right after mobilization is when organizers are like most likely to say that they've failed and um, that the like change can just be more nonlinear and and slower. Um, and then also if you looked at uh, kind of um, the really like local uh, geography of, of where the anti-fossil fuel mobilizations were coming from, because I guess from uh, thinking about uh, Canada as a place where it's been politicized for a very long time, and I think we, we haven't actually seen a, a ton of outcomes yet, I think, um, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, be thinking about Alberta, I think working in Alberta and talking about anti-fossil fuel work, there's there's actually been a lot of openness uh, to it, um, but it's that the kind of social movement institutions or funding have been uh, all outside of Alberta for the most part. And so I think some of that um, kind of, it, it's really always perceived as outside actors has been um, a part of the kind of uh, delay or like lack of uh, success so far. Although I should say, yeah, there's not that there's been nothing. There's uh, some change, I think. Gori, please. Okay, thanks for, for that question. I think uh, you're right. It's, uh, it's too early to say no. <laughs> it's, um, um, it's just that uh, the situation has been so much changed uh, since the Ukraine war, so that was sort of what I was alluding to. But of course, it's t it might be that this is a temporary setback for these kinds of mobilizations, but uh, at least what we see in Norway right now is that this whole um, focus that was so potent last year, especially it's only just one year ago this election took place, and it was uh, you know one of the top three issues for people in Norway uh, under the election was exactly this topic of uh, you know whether Norway should stop issuing new oil and gas exploration licenses and. Uh, um, and now uh, that discussion has just died away with the Ukraine crisis, with the mu much more focus on Norway as this reliable partner for Europe. So it's um, it's more like a, a delay, I would say, and the potential is definitely there because um, if and when the energy crisis uh, sort of gets better, uh, this issue will come back on the agenda in Norway, I think. And uh, your other question was about localized mobilization. And I would say that like in Norway, it's a, it's a dimension of cities versus the, versus the countryside. So people in the cities, especially young people in cities like um, Oslo and other larger cities in Norway, are much more, um, have a tendency towards uh, um, voting um, green. They're more, you know, um, 
uh, they are more uh, concerned about climate change issues in general, and uh, they have, uh, um, you know, supported the Green Party, especially in Oslo, uh, which where the Green Party is part of the governing coalition of Oslo, um, and uh, in other bigger cities too. So it's like more like a city uh, or urban rural dimension in Norway rather than but also related to what Florian said about the Southwest, where people actually um, have work in the oil industry. So, um, yeah, that's also part of this uh, debate in Norway. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have time for one really quick question, please. So the gentleman has his hand up. Quick question, please. Sorry, it may not be quick. Hey, I'll try my best. Um, as, again, for Goody, just to build on Norman's question there, it was about a sort of implication for Shell pulling out of the Campbell oil field was another company's come in, a smaller yeah. independent firm who are maybe more unaccountable and harder to, and, and so there's a kind of irony of the protest, right? It's quite, and that fits in a broader trend of the North Sea is that the major oil companies are pulling out and it's being filled in by these smaller independent firms. Mm. Uh, so that's something to consider, I thought, as well, as well, because your framework had a uh, the variables was political parties. But I think more important for the UK context is the political economy of it is that it's an independent regulator, the Oil and Gas Authority, who make the decision on licensing. So I wondered if you'd done interviews with those institutions as well, because, uh, yeah, it feels like to me the Scottish Parliament's more symbolic in this sort of space than making decisions on it. Yeah, so uh, we haven't finished doing the interviews yet. We're hoping to get interviews with government officials. Uh, haven't done that yet, but it would definitely be interesting to talk with them about uh, those issues that you raise. And uh, um, I know the well, the UK case studies. It's done by Fergus. He's sitting right behind you with the master. You could you could talk to him in the break. But uh, I feel like a you know. <laughs> Like I, I couldn't give you a full answer for what you asked about the UK case. Sorry about that. Florian has a quick comment. Yeah, just a quick comment. I think that's a super interesting um, point. I think we need much more like investigative research on that. It, it doesn't only happen in the North Sea. Like as the oil and gas majors pull out, there are these private equity companies moving in, um, and is actually like strategically advised um, to a lot of clients um, of large private banks to invest in these private equity companies because they're hugely profitable. Um, and, and it's completely under the radar. So I think there, yeah. And it, it really speaks to this, like what, what is the effect in the end of mobilization against um, you know, actions from, from these large corporates that are more accountable than opaque private equity firms, yeah. I, I like this call to action oriented research. That's really good, uh, good closing remarks. Thank you very much uh, for the panel. Give a hand of applause to our distinguished panel.